Our wives are our biggest heroes. <laughs> They're our only heroes. Or no, it's the other way around, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we're their only heroes, I guess. God is good, isn't he? And thank God for his blessings. Uh, thank the Lord for salvation. Thank God for church. And um, I heard someone say many years ago, they said, if you ever found the perfect church, don't join it. Because you'll mess it up. <laughs> There is no such thing as a perfect church on earth, but there will be one in heaven. And there will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more dying, no more crying, no more grief, no more pain, no more death. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Bible says we should comfort one another with these words. I think as Christianity has progressed, we, we sort of talk about heaven less. I don't know why we talk about heaven less. I think one of the reasons we talk about heaven less than we used to is because we have it so good here. You know, if real poverty ever came to us, we'd talk about heaven more. But we got big houses here. Do you know what the rest of the world calls your, calls your house? A mansion. And we've got three cars in the driveway and closets full of clothes and Pantries busting out with food, and and uh, I'll never forget when we were in Haiti, and some of these men will remember, we uh, fixed a breakfast for ourselves, several of us, about 14 of us men were there or so, fixed a breakfast for ourselves, and we had a, a place that we were staying there, not a nice place, no electricity, uh, but we were able to put together some food, and it was just a simple kind of breakfast, nothing fancy, uh, but it was good, we ate well. And then we had some leftovers, and there was this old dog that sort of walked around the house, and we had a notion of giving that leftover food to the dog. And one of the Haitians who sort of guarded the place for us, if you could have seen the look on his face when he realized that we were thinking about giving the scraps to the dog. It was a look of complete amazement on why we wouldn't give that to somebody who could eat it. A person. Him. American dogs eat better than a lot of the world. And I think if poverty ever really came to America again, we'd talk about heaven more. But we get really comfortable here. And I'm not saying we should argue against the blessings of God because I'm thankful for them. Uh, but uh, also looking forward to seeing the Lord and being with him. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter 6, please, for our message today? Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter number 6. I'll begin reading in verse number 30, and I'll read all the way through verse number 37. Verse number 30 of God's word says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread. 
for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred pennyworth of bread and give them to eat? Have you ever been really tired? Not sleepy tired, but beat up tired. Worn out tired. Uh, buffeted by life tired. Have you ever just wanted to be alone? Just nobody. Not even family. Just, I just want to be alone for a while. Have you ever been so grieved in your heart that any public appearing actually hurts? If a, if a crowd were there, you'd feel uncomfortable, you'd, you'd feel pain, you would want to leave the gathering of, of people because you're so hurt and grieved. I think the disciples are feeling this way in this text. I do. We know that they're tired. The Bible says they couldn't rest. The work that Jesus had commanded them to do was very trying and it was a time of testing and it was not easy. They had just in the previous chapter, they had went to Nazareth, which is the city all of them expected they would have a hero's welcome. After all, they were Jesus' disciples and Jesus came from Nazareth. We'll get a hero's welcome. Finally, a place where we will feel at home. And Nazareth said, get out of here. We don't want you. We don't want Jesus. We don't want his disciples. We don't want him to work here. We don't want him to teach here. We don't want him to minister here. So move on. They had just endured that. They had also just some, suffered something else that sort of hurt them. John the Baptist had been beheaded. Um, that's found in chap uh, this chapter, verse 27. Look at it, if you would please. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. And brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had seen. Not only was rejection heavy upon them, but the death of John the Baptist, this cruel death, this evil act, this death of, that was immorally driven by the dancing of a woman, that was unjustly called for, and that was... Uh, unjustly done. John the Baptist, who a, a man was a good man, an honest man, a godly man. Even Herod himself liked John the Baptist. But now he's dead. And his headless corpse is being buried by his disciples. And Jesus' disciples come and tell him. So not only are the disciples of Jesus tired... And not only are the disciples of Jesus fatigued and just beat, depressed, but I believe in some ways Jesus was very tired and very hurt too. It's one thing we have to understand that God became flesh. Jesus became flesh. Jesus took upon him the form of a man and was made in likeness of men. And he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be hurt. He knows what it's like to feel uh, betrayed. He knows what it's like to feel tired. He knows what it's like to just want to be alone. He knows what it feels like to just want to get away. He knows what it feels like to be, to be just buffeted to the point where you don't want to be around people. So he says to his disciples, let's go and rest. Makes sense, doesn't it? Verse number 31, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place 
and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So their bodies needed to recharge. They needed rest for their bodies to be able to continue to do the work. They needed food for their bellies so that they could have the energy uh, needed for the ministry. So in his wisdom, Jesus said, we're going to go to a private place, away from the crowds, away from the bustle, away from the demanding things of ministry, and we're just going to rest, we'll be alone. They hadn't rested in a long time, and they hadn't eaten in a long time. Being hungry will make you do weird things. Remember the Snickers commercial with Betty White in the football game, the pickup football game? And I think the tagline is, uh, you're not you when you're hungry. You know, and you see Betty White tackling this guy, you know, at, at full force. And then finally eats a Snickers bar and everything's okay. When you're hungry, you are sometimes rude. When you're hungry, you can be inconsiderate. When you're tired, you can be the same way. It wasn't long ago that I was a little out of character and I was barking at everybody in our house. And finally Sarah said, you need to rest. It had been sort of a strenuous week and some late nights and early mornings and she said, you need to rest. And I was on edge. I, I just wasn't myself. I was tired. And I was short with people and I was selfish. The disciples are tired. Jesus is tired. They are hungry. They're trying to get alone. They get in a little boat. and They go across the Sea of Galilee. Maybe they just went, cut the corner or something of the Sea of Galilee. Thinking we'll just escape into the, into the horizon of this sea and go to a place where nobody is. And the Bible says in verse 33, And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. Can you picture this? You have just launched out of this little bay on this boat you're going across to the quiet place you can't hardly wait to get to the quiet place to rest to eat and as you're coming closer to the shore one of the disciples says is that people over there <laughs> I thought we we're going to the desert place is that a lot that's a that's a crowd that's a multitude I wonder if maybe they could see the people running along the shore sort of as they cut across. They're seeing the people run around on land on, on foot to, out, to, out, to race them to the ending point to see. This would have been a time that many of us would have snapped. We would have lost it. We would have, we would have flew off the handle. But I love what the scripture says in verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Do you know today that there is no off duty in the Christian life? You know, you approach a store and they have a neon sign that either says open or closed. Or maybe the open sign is off. And it is their signal to say, if you want some Krispy Kreme donuts now, you ain't getting them. Because we're closed. Or if you want to get that new set of shoes, you can't get it. Because we're closed. So you have to get to the store in the window of opportunity of service. And in the Christian life, there is no window of Christianity. There is no, I am off duty as a Christian today. 
They wanted to find a private place. They wanted to find an alone place. They wanted to check out for a while. But the need was still there. At work, the Christian's not off duty. Do we think our Christianity is only Sunday morning only? That our Christianity is only for when we're around other believers? But our, who we are can change when we go to work? At school, should we be a different person at school than we are at church? I think the world has something. And here's what they have. Sometimes when they call us hypocrites, they're right. They're right. Because we act differently here than we do there. And we act differently here than we do at work. Or we act differently here than we do when we've had a hard day. We'll excuse ourselves and say, well, I would be a little better, but you just don't understand the day I've had. Or the struggles that I've endured. Or actually, I'm on vacation. So because I'm on vacation, I have carp compartmentalized my Christian life that vacation is when I take the open sign and I pull the little chain and turn it off and I'm closed I thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't off duty he didn't send the crowd away he didn't tell them go home he didn't say I'm too tired he didn't say I haven't the time just quite the contrary, he had compassion, was moved with compassion. Jesus sees every need. You know what is, is noticeably missing in the text? Is the disciples' response to seeing the crowd. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus saw them, had compassion, was moved, his heart was broken. But I wonder what Peter was saying. I wonder what Andrew piped up or John or some of these other guys. I wonder what their response was. We're not told what their response was when they saw the crowd, but we have a little clue, and I want to give you what the clue is. Because later that day when they needed the, the, the multitude needed to eat, does anybody remember what the disciples suggested? Send them away now. I mean, this is a perfect time, Lord. We could have done it earlier in the day, but now this is the great time. Just send them out. Let them go home. I believe that would have been right, my response. I truly believe that. Instead, Jesus saw their need. He saw the personal need. Now, I can't prove this from Scripture, but I believe when the Lord Jesus Christ looked at a crowd, he didn't see a crowd. I believe when Jesus looked at a crowd, he saw people. He saw individual sets of eyes. And we, we, we look at groups like, well, here's a big group. But the Lord Jesus looks at groups different. He does. This is a crowd here today. It's a good Sunday morning crowd. But I will tell you, Jesus doesn't see a crowd. He sees you. Amen. All of you. He sees you. And he knows your need. And he knows the personal needs of a person's life. To the U.S. government, I'm just a Social Security number. To the state of Ohio, I'm just a driver's license number. I had to call my insurance this week from the wind that blew some shingles off, and they never asked my name. They just want to know policy number. When you take the tab at the fast food restaurant, you're just a number on the ticket, 249, number 249. Where's number 249? To my bank, I'm just a bank account number, a checking account number. But I want you all to hear me today. To the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not just a number. This crowd that gathered on the shore of this Sea of Galilee was not just a group. The Lord Jesus saw past that. He saw to the needs of their soul and their spirit. He saw the needs on the inside that no one else could see. Needs that were very real and tangible and needs that could only be met by spiritual means. I'm concerned that we're trying physical things to meet spiritual needs. I read not long ago that they were putting together a particular church uh, 
building, and they, one of the things they said was they said, when, when people come through the door, we want them to smell the smell of fresh roasted gourmet coffee. And they actually said that was part of their design was that the smell would approach the door when they come in because it would make people feel at home. I'll tell you, coffee will not meet the needs of people's souls. We can do a lot of things in church that may not be bad in and of themselves, a good PowerPoint presentation or a slide or some kind of catchy sermon title or a funny story, but those things don't meet the needs of a person's soul. The Lord Jesus Christ saw past all of that and looked at these people and said, they're just like sheep. And they're scattered. They don't even have a shepherd. Jesus sees your need. If there's one animal in the world that needs a shepherd, a sheep needs shepherds. I have never been much with sheep, but I've read my share. And all the places I've read have come to one conclusion. I can make it quick. Sheep are stupid. <laughs> they don't know where to go, what to do, how to eat, how to drink, where to walk, how to turn around, what to listen to. They don't have any clue to make it on their own whatsoever. And Jesus looked out at this crowd on the sea that had ran a long distance around just to meet them when they got to the shore. And he saw them like sheep without a shepherd. Didn't these people have spiritual leaders? Didn't they? We could all name some today. You know them, you Bible readers. Scribes, Pharisees, priests, uh, they, had all, they had spiritual leaders everywhere. And this, these spiritual leaders had taught them plenty. They had gone to the temple and heard the teaching. They had gone before these religious people and heard what they had to say. But even still, with all of the teaching they had heard from these quote-unquote religious people, they still, when they saw Jesus and his disciples going to the other side, they said, we're going to take a long race around so we can be there when they come because whatever he's saying is what we need to hear. There's lots of voices in the world today. Pharisees didn't care. They were politically motivated. The Pharisees and the religious crowd was culturally motivated. They were financially motivated. That was their drive. They were proud, corrupt, and selfish. They cared not for the people nor their spiritual condition. Sort of like in our world today. Lots of voices you can listen to. You can listen to a Dr. Phil. You can listen to an Oprah. You can listen to a Facebook uh, uh, group. You know, become a member of a group and see what everybody posts in the group on a certain thing. You can listen to the counsel of your friends or worldly rationale. In fact, even Herod, the very temple that they went to in this day was built by Herod, who was a political puppet. And he built this beautiful temple, uh, an amazing architectural structure, all so the people will come and have some togetherness and some community, and they'll all come to the temple and they'll all love me. But the needs of the souls of men were not being met. And they ran, ran around a lake to get to the Lord Jesus Christ and to hear him. These people had never truly been fed. Their souls were hungry, and they were thirsty. And I want to ask you this question. What did Jesus teach them? I wish, I wish so much that in between verse number um, 34 and 35, when it says he began to teach them many things, I wish there would be about another three chapters in there on what he said. But God in his wisdom chose not to tell us exactly what he said. But I do have another passage of scripture that I think would fit in really good. Verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. 
But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, and to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not for, for, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. If Jesus saw these people as sheep having no shepherd, it seems like with those words, their need may be met. The teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the word of God is what the soul needs. It's what the heart needs. We may think that we need some therapy. And churches are becoming therapeutic. Where the administration wishes to give life therapy. Or find someone in the church to be their life coach. You know who your life coach should be? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life. He said in that same passage, he says, No man taketh my life from me. He says, I lay it down of myself. And praise God, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It's impossible for me today to look out at this congregation and know what every need of every person is. But I do know this. Jesus can meet everyone. And if you're not saved, you need to be saved. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, why would you dance around with the question of eternity? It's not worth dancing around. It's not worth letting go. It's not worth toying with. Jesus said he came to give his life and to lay down his life for the sheep so that we might have abundant life. It's all in John chapter number 10. The best life you can live is a Christian life. It's a life that has been given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a life that has realized that he is the Savior. It's a life in which you have come to the point where you have seen him on the cross, you have watched him shed his blood, and you have come to the point where you've realized he did that for me. And I accept him. I accept him. Many things in life we can have, but we must accept them first. There's not one married person here that did not get married except for you accepted the proposal. Two people stood at the altar, and both of them had to say, I'm in, or I do. <laughs> both have to say it. You say, no, I got married sort of ipso facto. Nobody does. And I will tell you this, nobody gets saved ipso facto. Well, I just sort of fell into this thing. I've always been saved. I've always known the Lord. Not until you said I do to him. Not until you said, I accept your offering, I accept your death, I accept your plea toward me, I accept your love toward me, and I'm giving my life to you, and I want you to save me and wash me clean. No one's saved until that happens. Oh, the joy of knowing the Lord is our Savior. But what struck me also as I try to bring this to a close today is I had never really realized how tired these disciples must have been now, think through the process with me. Rejected in Nazareth, 
John the Baptist beheaded. They went and told Jesus, everybody's discouraged. Let's go to a private place. Big crowd of people there. Jesus teaches all day to the crowd on the shore. And now he says at the end of the day, well, we got to feed them. And these tired, whipped men pipe up and say, well, send them home. The Lord Jesus says in verse 37, He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Yes, it is a miracle that the Lord Jesus can take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 people. And I have preached and taught that story many times on the provision of God, the miracle working of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I also want to take a little different slant as I close this. How about the joy of serving the Lord even when you're tired? Give ye them to eat. I wanted to ask this today, and maybe there, are, there might be some here. I don't know. Is there anybody here who wouldn't mind just slipping a hand up if this is you, but you have participated in serving a meal, one meal, to a group of 5,000 people or more? Anybody here? that's participated in serving a meal to 5,000, a group of 5,000 people or more. Anybody? I, that's what I thought would happen. <laughs> we, we sort of read the Bible and say, well, yeah, they just fed 5,000 people. You know, just walk around, you know, get them all plates, find them some napkins, put centerpieces on the table, you know, just get everybody ready, just serve the meal. Here are these tired, weary, bone sore men who have not rested and they have not eaten. And they've just tried to get away and now there's another crowd that needs help. And Jesus says to them at the end of another long day, well, feed them. Feed them. Feed them. They try to get out of it more. Well, we got no food. We'd like to, Lord. We really are in this thing, but... We looked all around, just can't find nothing. Oh, except for this one lad. He's got five loaves and two fishes, but we know that won't work. Everybody knows. Five loaves and two fishes, that'd never work. Jesus said, bring them here. Bring them to me. And you know they brought the five loaves and two fishes, and Jesus started breaking it, right? Breaking it, blessed it, break it. And the disciples started breaking it. They're like, man, this is still here. It's still going. It's still dividing. It's still there. The basket's full. The pan's full. And they served. How long did it take to serve 5,000 people? I don't know. But I do know this. The disciples were blessed by serving. When they were tired. When they were weary to the bone. Mark records this event. He doesn't record it with any hint of regret. He doesn't record this event with, I can't believe he asked us to do it. He doesn't record this event with, it was totally unfair, it was an unfair day all around. I believe the blessing that they received through serving these 5,000 was one of the greatest times of their life. The secret to a fulfilled Christian life is service. It always has been and it always will be. As long as the Christian is content, let me have my Christian life and don't bother me with doing anything. You're missing out on the wonder of being a believer. There's joy in serving Jesus, the song says. I'm going to tell you a story about Joan. Joan was an alcoholic. Her husband was a gambler. Actually, she calls herself a drunk. They had two teen daughters and a five-year-old girl. The divorce papers were already written up. Joan and her husband decided this was it. We're splitting up. We'll figure out what to do with the kids. But I don't like this life. The Friday before they were to sign the papers... An old friend 
came to see them. This old friend, they didn't realize, but he had become a Christian, gotten saved. Came to visit Joan and her husband. And on that Friday night, he talked to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. How Jesus meets the needs of the soul and spirit. How he forgives sins and gives us a home in heaven. That he is the worker of miracles. Can restore marriages and men families. And that night, Joan and her husband knelt at their kitchen table and got saved. They started serving right away. Joan's husband worked in the bus ministry at their church. Joan didn't want to work in the bus ministry. She said, I'll do some other things. I'll sing, I'll work in the office, I'll do some cleaning, I'll even take my nursery time, but you do that bus ministry thing, I, I'm not in that. He kept begging her, Joan, come on, you've got to help me in this, but I need you in the bus ministry. I need your help. He begged and begged and begged, and she refused and refused and refused. Until one day he said, look, if you'll just go visiting with me, it's Saturday, if you'll go with me today to visit the kids for the bus route, if you'll do that today, I'll never ask you again to help me. She thought, well, this is my chance. I'll get them off my back finally. So she went. They went to the house of a little girl named Mary. They knocked on the door, and she didn't want to go inside, but her husband sort of coaxed her in. Mary and her, Mary was six years old, and her siblings were sort of standing around an oak table. There were no chairs to sit at. Very little furniture in the house at all. Mary's father was sitting on a little tiny couch with beer in his hand, watching television. And her husband said to Mary and to her siblings, are you guys coming to church tomorrow? Mary was the first to pipe up. She says, I'm coming. And Joan is just sort of standing in the background listening, and she hears Mary's mother say, Mary, you can't go to church tomorrow because you don't have any shoes. And Joan said at that point, Mary started to cry because she couldn't go to church. She didn't have shoes. Joan said seeing that little girl cry just broke her heart. She said, I ran out of the house and went in the car and sat in the car and just cried. And Joan said, while I was in the car, I prayed for Mary and I prayed for her family. And she said, I also told God in the car that I'd serve him in the bus ministry. I'll do it. With tears coming down her cheeks. And she said that afternoon also we bought some shoes for Mary so she could come to church. Now that's not the end of the story. Joan right now is 76 years old. Presently, 76. The church she ministers in is in uh, Covington, Indiana, Maranatha Baptist Church. She is still serving in the bus ministry every Saturday, every Sunday. She's been doing it for 41 years. 41 years. She said in her testimony that I read, she said, I used to teach Sunday school also, but it was too much on a Sunday morning for me to do the bus ministry and Sunday school at this age. She still visits on Saturday and still rides the old church bus on Sunday morning. I said all that to say this. I know life makes us tired. I get it. I know there are weeks we stay up late, get up early, and the boss is squeezing everything out of us that we, he can get. And life is pummeling us on the head. And, but I want to remind us now, the blessing these men received after several days of rigorous torture, tired eyes, bloodshot eyes, 
aching joints. And then Jesus said, you feed them. I think it became the, one of the greatest times of these men's lives to see what Jesus did feeding 5,000 people. I do know this. The Lord Jesus with tired eyes sees a need. And I wonder what we see with tired eyes. I wonder what we see with our tired eyes. Let's bow our heads for prayer today.